It's my honor today to welcome on our show, Dr. Terry Walls. Dr. Terry Walls is an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner and a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa, where she conducts clinical trials in the setting of multiple sclerosis. In 2018, she was awarded the Institute for Functional Medicine's Linus Pauling Award for her contributions in research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. She is the author of the Walls Protocol book, a radical new way to treat all chronic autoimmune conditions using paleo principles. And she also has a cookbook, The Walls Protocol Cooking for Life. She is currently doing research on efficacy of diet on quality of life in multiple sclerosis. And you will find the link in our show notes. Welcome Terry Walls to our show. Great. Thank you for having me. Yes. So today I'm really excited about uh, the topic that we have chosen. Uh, it's about autoimmunity and food. Uh, we know that autoimmunity, Hashimoto's disease, MS, and other autoimmune diseases are mm -hmm. creating a big epidemic. And uh, food is such a major role uh, that it plays. And I think yes, you, know, you have done like years of research and, you know, obviously treated several, probably thousands or even like millions of patients only with food, um, with, uh, with MS. But before we go into all that, you know, uh, talk about food and autoimmunity, we'd like to hear your story because, you know, I think you have a very, very inspiring story of you yourself yeah. being an autoimmune disease. So if you can share with the clients, that'll be wonderful. Sure. So in 2000, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and that was on the basis of a weakness in my uh, left leg. Uh, and you know, being a physician, I sought out the very best MS center, took the newest drugs. Um, still, within three years, I converted to the progressive phase of the illness. I needed a tilt-recline wheelchair. I also have trigeminal neuralgia that was getting relentlessly worse. And uh, it was very clear I was headed towards becoming bedridden, uh, quite possibly demented, uh, and quite possibly having my trigeminal neuralgia turn permanently on. Now, at that time, I went back to reading the basic science, uh, and I developed theories that the progressive phase of the illness is tied to the mitochondria, uh, and I started taking supplements to support my mitochondria. It helped my fatigue a little bit, and for that, I'm uh, very, very grateful. Then I, I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. I uh, took their course in neuroprotection. I had a longer list of supplements. You know, and, and I had already uh, switched from a vegetarian diet uh, that had been following for 20 years to a paleo diet uh, based on the recommendations of my uh, neurologist. Uh, and so now so I had the ancestral health movement. I had functional medicine. I had these supplements uh, targeting my mitochondria. And then I finally had this really big aha. Like, what if I redesigned my paleo diet based on what I had learned from my own review of the research and functional medicine? Uh, so this list of uh, 17 supplements that I was taking, like wh where are these nutrients in the food supply? So I reorganized my diet. And that's really when the magic began. Uh, my physical therapist is like, you know, Terry, you're getting stronger. You advanced my exercises. In fact, uh, in just a year's time, I went from being unable to sit up, where I had to uh, depend on a tilt recline wheelchair, to being able to walk again, and to being able to uh, bike. Um, uh, the day that I uh, biked for the first time in six years, um, you know, my son's jogging on the left. My beside me, my daughter on the right, Jackie, my wife behind me. Um, and as I go, go around the block, my son is crying, my daughter's crying, Jackie's crying, I'm crying, of course. Uh, and then uh, six months after that, um, we signed me up for a the Courage Ride, which is 18.5 miles. Wow. And once again, when, when I cross the finish line, everybody's crying, my kids are crying, my wife's crying, I'm crying. And of course, this fundamentally changes um, how I'm thinking about disease and health. It will change the way I practice medicine, and it will change uh, the research that I do. Uh, and that was uh, all of that happened in 2008. So we're almost 15 years into this uh, transformation. 
Wow, that is amazing. You know, I've heard obviously your story before multiple times, but whenever I hear it again, it just gives me goosebumps, you know. It's like impossible thing that you achieved, you know, um, when such like 20 years ago when functional medicine was not so much and we did not knew much about the impact of diet on autoimmunity and you curated this new path for all the MS clients and also for all the autoimmune clients. That was just amazing. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I had such success in my primary care clinic. Then I was also assigned to the traumatic brain injury clinic that the chief of medicine at uh, the VA hospital I was at uh, and the chief of staff asked me to leave primary care clinic and create a new clinic. We called it the therapeutic lifestyle clinic. And in that clinic, you know, I basically used diet and lifestyle and very, very basic supplements uh, on shoulder, you know, vitamin D, minimal dose, 2000 units, uh, a multivitamin, uh, a B complex and fish oil. So very, very basic stuff. Wow. And we taught people how to basically fall, follow the walls diet. And we saw people with a wide variety of autoimmune problems. Uh, and many of them were uh, fairly advanced in their disease. They're uh, uh, disabled. They've been unable to work for years. And we helped them turn their lives around. It's really quite, quite remarkable. Wow, that is amazing. You know, obviously, like, you know, we have been using your diet, you know, some kind of, you know, your protocols, you know, in our uh, practice also, and obviously we see great results. So, so thank you for yeah. like, you know, writing those books and, you know, educating all of us, you know, into those things. So why don't we directly delve into, you know, the food and the autoimmune aspect and please share some things about yeah. the Walt's diet that you have kind of. Sure. Well, you know, the first thing I, I want to uh, talk to your audience is that I, I, I've seen the research. I know most of you don't cook anymore, that you've been so pressed for time, you're eating fast food, you eat a lot of processed food. If you are cooking, you're uh, unfortunately often cooking boxed foods that someone else has prepared. So there's a lot of processed food, a lot of high glycemic index food that is wrecking your health, that is wrecking your microbiome that is driving the innate immune system to be overactive, which will make MS worse, which would make uh, autoimmune uh, thyroid disease worse, which would make your inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, all these autoimmune disease uh, conditions worse. So step number one, uh, when uh, people come in uh, to our clinic, um, we sort out, do they have inflammatory bowel disease? If they do, uh, then we're going to have to do a, a, a lot of soups, stews, cooked foods, and we take out all of the uh, salads, uh, raw vegetables, uh, and fruits. If they don't have inflammatory bowel disease, uh, then I can uh, work on adding more vegetables, these radical things known as vegetables. Uh, so we talk a lot about uh, greens, uh, sulfur-rich, cabbage, onion, uh, mushroom family vegetables, and deeply colored. Uh, and, and one of those tools that we do, Ancho, mm -hmm. is um, what I, I have a partner uh, dietitian that I'd work with, and we would bring in our uh, kitchen on wheels. It's a, a wonderful device that the VA had. Uh, and so the first task, we'd pass around some uh, either dandelion greens or kale greens, because they're very, really very bitter. And we have people chewing these, and they're like, oh my God, they're so bitter. So we, yes, greens are bitter. Then we serve them our green smoothie with green grapes, ice, a little olive oil, uh, and these very bitter greens. And now they're like, well, actually, that was pretty tasty. That was, in fact, <laughs> delicious. Uh, and so that's a big aha, like, okay, we can take a food that they would all agree is incredibly bitter, and we can make it into a delicious smoothie. So that's uh, step number two. Then step number three is making cooked greens. Uh, and we sort out, are they uh, meat eaters? Do they eat pork? If they do, we'll, we'll fry up some bacon and make bacon and greens. If we have uh, people who don't eat pork in our class, then we do uh, uh, cooked greens without using pork. And we might use uh, ghee uh, uh, and uh, some mushrooms, some onions, uh, add in the greens. 
And we, we stir that, hook the greens, just a minute, just so they're wilted. And then we pass them around and they're like, oh my gosh, uh, those are delicious. So that aha makes it possible for them to feel like, okay, I could actually eat this food. And we also are very, very um, keen that the patient comes with their family member uh, to this class so that the family member who's gonna be eating this food realizes that yes, they can take bitter food that feels like something they couldn't possibly get their family to eat and make it into a, a delicious smoothie or a delicious cooked vegetable. Now this becomes much, much easier. And we show them how fast you can make this meal so that it's not a time burden. Because people need to eat food that tastes good. They need to eat food that they can prepare. Uh, and um, our patients, you know, they're living in rural Iowa, going to small rural grocery stores. We have to teach them how to cook, meal plan, shop at their local grocery store, and then prepare their meals with the energies that they have. Mm -hmm. And, and at my clinic, you know, these folks were exhausted. Uh, they had pain, they had fatigue, uh, and uh, they were disabled living on food stamps. So we had to figure out affordable, right? small town grocery stores, and affordable in terms of dollars, and affordable in terms of the energy and time spent uh, cooking. Uh, uh, so we had, we had such success, Anshul, that the VA central office mm -hmm. heard about what I was doing, called us up, and they wanted to come see us. And I'm like, okay, uh, am I going to get in trouble now? <laughs> but, you know, they came. Uh, it was a, a wonderful visit. Uh, we uh, enjoyed hosting them. Uh, they saw my clinic, our intake process. Uh, they saw our uh, kitchen, traveling kitchen on wheels, and how we were teaching our vets how to cook, how to shop, how to meal plan. Uh, and then uh, actually lovely to see, we helped them take these concepts into their whole health clinic that now uh, is much more universal uh, throughout the VA. Uh, and so they're, they're using the concepts that people have to be able to shop in their local community. Uh, so you need to understand what's available. Uh, we need to help them uh, have a cooking demonstration in clinic so they understand that, yes, vegetables uh, can be bitter, um, but with the proper preparation, with fat, um, with some uh, acid as in a vinegar or a citrus, you can reduce the pH, so take it from alkaline to neutral or slightly acidic, uh, and that bitterness goes away. Wow. And now it's it's delicious. And uh, uh, now it becomes very easy to get the uh, family on board. Oh. You're not going to get your kids on board uh, giving them bitter vegetables. When we took <laughs> that out of the vegetables and it became bitter, it, uh, then it became very hard to get the rest of the family uh, to eat these vegetables. That's true. I mean, you touched based on, you know, very important things, you know, especially these bitter vegetables have so many health benefits, but, you know, almost nobody likes to eat them. So, you know, with the cooking tips that you have given, you know, I think I'm sure a lot more people will be able to try these vegetables and they will see that they're really not so bad. Correct, correct. Um, so the, the bitterness is a reflection of the high pH, the alkalinity, uh, and uh, these bitter, strong flavored vegetables have so many uh, helpful phytonutrients, so many compounds that lower the innate immune system activity uh, through the NRF2 pathway and the NF-kappa B pathways uh, in the inflammasome pathways that need to either be turned off if it's the inflammasome and NF-kappa B or turned up if it's the NRF2 pathway. So we have um, a better balance to our immune system. But doing that means that uh, if we learn some of these culinary techniques uh, uh, from our chefs that we would have come work with us. Uh, and so this is about having fat um, uh, and having some acid. Uh, so a vinegar 
um, or a uh, lemon juice, lime juice uh, will neutralize that pH. And you'll find that things that you know tasted so bitter when we uh, fed them to the class raw are now delicious. Awesome. So, I mean, you know, you shared about great things about the bitters and the greens, you know, what are the other principles of this diet? Are there certain foods that you eliminate? Yeah. Certain foods you want to them to okay. eat? Okay. So, so the first thing we stress is what to add. Uh, we've talked about the greens, uh, the cabbage family, onion family, mushroom family, deeply colored. Uh, so beets, carrots, uh, berries. Uh, and then we talk about what to remove. So uh, get rid of the added sugars, uh, the sodas that have all that high fructose corn syrup, sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, we want to remove gluten. The, and I explained that for many, particularly those of us with a autoimmune disorder, we're likely to have an abnormal immune response to gluten. And that's the uh, protein in wheat, rye, barley, and many of our ancient grains. And the protein in dairy um, also has a similar amino acid sequence to the protein in gluten. Uh, and for that reason, I want people to take out gluten and dairy. I also encourage them to take out eggs, at least temporarily. Uh, eggs, particularly the yolk, are a superfood, fabulously good for us. However, the egg white, the protein in egg whites, is a common uh, source of food sensitivities. So it's the third most common food sensitivity issue uh, here in North America. So I encourage people to take out gluten, dairy, and eggs. Uh, after uh, three months, if they want to try uh, egg yolks first, see if they tolerate the egg yolks, and then they can see if they can tolerate the egg white uh, as well. Uh, and, and then we have a conversation, because uh, I want, want to understand, are they vegetarian or vegan? Is that for spiritual beliefs? If that's the case, uh, we will certainly honor that. Uh, but then I'll, I'll want to be sure that they have balanced their diet, that they have uh, adequate protein, have adequate iodine, uh, adequate omega-3s, and, that, and I'm thinking about uh, zinc. Uh, so I may supplement the um, vegetarian vegans a bit more thoroughly. If they are a meat eater, uh, then we'll talk about uh, a paleolithic diet. Uh, and depending on, are they diabetic, pre-diabetic? Um, uh, do they have risk factors for metabolic syndrome? Um, if, if any of those things are present, then we put them on a lower carb diet. I, I'm thinking about um, uh, I can do to lower the risk of metabolic syndrome. Awesome. Great. So, I mean, a lot of our actually listeners are vegan or vegetarian. And obviously, whenever yes. they hear about any autoimmune diet, then they always get concerned about especially the protein piece of it. Because, you know, like uh, uh -huh. vegetarian diets, you know, the protein can be lacking. So, you know, shed some light, especially for vegan or vegetarians. How do you replenish, like, you know, protein? So, so for the vegan and the vegetarian, and again, I want to be very clear that in the WASP protocol, we do have strategies to support the vegan and vegetarians. For the protein, I ask that they uh, cook their legumes, uh, so dolls, uh, uh, soybeans, in a pressure cooker. And I want them to use a gluten-free gra grain. Uh, so often this will be brown rice uh, and legumes. And, uh, and again, I want to tell your audience that many of our patients at the VA were living on food stamps. So funds were very tight. Uh, and so we, in fact, we teach them how to do vegetarian vegan meals to make things more affordable for them. Uh, and we talk about get, having a pressure cooker using things like uh, the Instant Pot. I would also talk, teach them how to make fermented uh, lentils uh, and fermented uh, soybeans, uh, black beans, uh, uh, natto, uh, which is a great source of uh, vitamin K2. So uh, yes, absolutely, it's quite possible. Um, we wanna be sure that people know legumes, plus a uh, grain, uh, so legumes plus uh, rice is the way to go. Now, it can be a little um, trickier if the person has metabolic syndrome, then I'm working on a lower carbohydrate version of this. 
Uh, and so then I'm leaning uh, more uh, thoroughly into soybean based products uh, because they have a complete protein. Awesome. Now, obviously, you know, there has been a concern about lectins, you know, especially like, you know, using the beans and the legumes and the legumes. Yeah. A lot of people are concerned and, you know, yes. a lot of different, like, you know, functional medicine doctors. And I think there are two different camps. One thing they are completely bad for you and the other camp things, if you cook them properly, then they are okay. So what are your thoughts about it? Well, you know, it, again, it will depend on the individual. So it depends on the level of sensitivity. For some individuals, taking the lectins out uh, appears to be a really uh, great strategy. But, and that's one of the reasons that people will lean into the paleo diet uh, or may even go so far as to advocate for the carnivore diet, which is entirely uh, animal products. I have to remind those folks that even meat is filled with lectins. So even the carnivores um, who are trying to do their carnivore diet to avoid lectins and plants, they're still eating a lot of lectins uh, in the meat. And even if they're, uh, and then there are carnivores who uh, eat only raw meat, trying to get away from the lectins. So it's it's not possible to have a completely lectin-free diet. Um, for those who are vegetarian or vegans, you can reduce your lectin burden by using a pressure cooker, which is why I, I lean into the pressure cookers. I and for people who want to uh, continue to have the nightshades. Uh, so that's tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. Cook those in a pressure cooker on high. Uh, and if they want to continue having their legumes and grains, again, cook that in the pressure cooker on high. That will break down the lectins. Uh, it will make them more digestible and less of a problem. For the majority of folks, the pressure cooker will take care of the lectin issue. Uh, but for some, uh, that will not be the case, uh, and we're going to have to have a more intensive uh, uh, process. And, and then for, for those individuals, uh, then I'm working harder on repairing the leaky gut, giving them digestive enzymes so we can more completely digest those proteins. So if we have a healed leaky gut, more uh, digestive enzymes so the proteins are digested, it, there'll be less of a problem. But you know th that person may require a, a, a uh, more intensive support uh, from from my clinical team to get everything healed up for them. Absolutely. Great. The other question a lot of people have is about soybeans. You know, like, you know, there is again, like a lot of diets do say that, you know, they should be eliminating soy. Yeah. You know, but obviously, you know, we have this regular soy and then we have this fermented soy, you know, where the tempeh and the tofu well, and all those things come into play. So what do you have thoughts about that? So I have a, a, a number of things to talk about with soy. So the consumption of a lot of soy is driving the deforestation uh, in uh, Brazil. Um, so... Uh, there is such demand for soy products that we end up uh, driving uh, agricultural uh, practice into areas where we should never have tilled, unfortunately. I'll set that aside. Uh, if we are consuming soy, um, then if you have fermented soy, it will have a less of an estrogenic component. Uh, and so that will be uh, better tolerated. If you're having soy milk, that's a relatively new product that um, I, I, I'm not sure how digestible that really is. Um, but if we're having fermented soy, those are products that we've been consuming for uh, thousands of years as part of our diet. Uh, and so I have a lot of enthusiasm uh, for those products. Great, great. Thank you so much for putting that insight. Um, the other question a lot of people have, especially with Hashimoto's patients, they're very, very concerned about these cruciferous vegetables, you know, that, you know, they're goitrogenic or they can yes. be helpful for people. And obviously we know that they are so nutritionally, you know, like high in sulforaphanes and other things. So uh, what is your thought about Well, that? so the, the um, cabbage family vegetables compete with the uptake of iodine slightly. Uh, and so... There's a very simple solution to that. 
add a little seaweed to your diet. So if you have a adequate intake of iodine, uh, that will be okay. Uh, now, the other question, and, and, you could, and you'll probably have some opinions about this, how much iodine do you take without getting too much iodine so that you make your Hashimoto's worse? Uh, and so that uh, uh, requires some nuance because uh, you don't want to overdo the iodine. That creates a problem. If you have a little bit of seaweed, uh, a little uh, dulse, uh, a, a little kelp, uh, uh, start once a month, then uh, twice a month, then um, uh, check in with your um, free T4, uh, free T3, TSH, and that will help guide what is the correct dose of uh, seaweed in your diet. That's so great. You know, like we had so many other people talking about this big debate about whether iodine is good and bad and what is the optimal, like, you know, a level of iodine. And I'm in the same category as you is that my main iodine goes through, you know, a diet, which is the sea vegetables, the seaweed and things. Mm -hmm. I generally don't add, I'm not recommending any iodine through supplements because some of them can have very, very high amounts and uh, can multiply. So I just, I'm just glad that you are also the same opinion. You know, it, it also depends uh, on the circumstances for that patient. If the patient is dealing with a uh, chronic tick-borne illness infections, uh, the iodine that we have in our cells is a very helpful tool for my cells to kill uh, infections. It's also a very helpful tool in my cells to eliminate uh, mercury. So I, I, I always want to understand my patient and what are all of their factors contributing to their autoimmune disease. Is there an infectious factor? Is there a toxic load factor? Uh, because that will shift what I'm doing. Awesome. So that actually comes to uh, the next question is that, you know, a lot of autoimmune conditions do have root causes. You know, obviously diet or food plays an important role, but unless we address the root causes, you know, as you were having a discussion before that the client or the patients do not completely get better. So can you Correct. just shed some light about the root causes that you think, you know, uh, yeah. role in autoimmunity? So we have the genes, 200 to 300 different genes for MS. And that's probably true for and a slightly different mix of genes, whether it's uh, autoimmune thyroiditis or inflammatory bowel disease, RA, lupus. Uh, most people with those genes don't, don't get the autoimmune disease. So, we have genes that put us at risk. Then we have an infection. Right now we know there are 16 different microbes that increase the risk for uh, MS. Uh, and then either you clear that infection well or you do not. Uh, and that appears to begin the cascade. Other things that can accelerate this are microbiome disturbances, so early antibiotics, uh, recurrent antibiotics, uh, uh, tobacco use, Air pollution, you know, we have so many, here in the United States, so many wildfires uh, that are decreasing air quality. And then industrial areas have lower air quality, uh, water pollution. Uh, then we have the hormone uh, disruptors uh, from uh, the plastics, the solvents, uh, the fragrances that can lead to uh, problems with estrogen, testosterone, uh, uh, and problems with their thyroid metabolism and persisting infections. When we get infected with a virus, uh, and probably many of our bacteria, we used to think that, you know, my immune system eliminated uh, those microbes entirely. Um, but I, I think there's more of a, an awareness that we simply control them. Uh, and if we have a strong, vigorous immune system, we control them very well. But after age 45, our immune system begins to falter. And if we have a very poor diet and lifestyle, that faltered immune system falters uh, much more rapidly. And we have a, a wide variety of root causes. We have the genetic factors. Uh, then you have an infection uh, that begins the process. Uh, and if we're lucky, we clear the infection and we never develop autoimmunity. Um, or we don't clear the infection, 
Uh, and as part of ke keeping that infection at bay, we also develop the autoimmune process. Other things that are accelerants to the autoimmune process are microbiome troubles, so early antibiotics, hormone uh, disruptors that can be compounds in our environment that interfere with our sex hormones uh, or our, our cortisol hormones, lack of exercise, uh, the pollution in the air and water, tobacco use. Uh, so in my practice, I do a detailed intake to understand what are all these contributing factors. So I can address them one by one. And it can be overwhelming if I try to address all of them from the very beginning. So I, I, then I have a conversation uh, with my patients uh, about where we want to start. And I encourage them to start with food, but not everyone is ready to start there. Sometimes we, we start with exercise. Sometimes we start with uh, stress reduction. Uh, and then we begin to work on all of these environmental factors one by one as the person is ready uh, to take that on. Awesome. That's a great process. You know, something similar is what we follow in our practice too, looking at all the root causes initially and then making a stepwise plan to get them better. Now, do you do these just with an intake form or, you know, generally you rely on testing also for infections or toxins and things? Where are you with that? Well, you know, the, the beauty of my time at the VA was that, you know, I got to my first clinic was the Trek Branger Clinic. We got no labs. My primary care clinic, we got to have some really basic primary care labs. Then when I got to set up the therapeutic lifestyle clinic, I got to have more time, uh, but I also could only get basic primary care labs. So I learned that we could get really fabulous results with incredibly basic labs, uh, lipids, glucose, fasting insulin, uh, homocysteine, B12 folate, vitamin D. Uh, and that's what I do for most folks. Now, I will also get hormones, uh, sex hormones, um, thyroid hormones. Uh, and I assume people are toxic. And we just go ahead and address that. I have a good sense of what the exposures are based on um, uh, the environmental history. I do not do food sensitivity testing. I put people on elimination diet, and we make a clinical assessment in terms of how they are responding. And we have really marvelous, marvelous results. It's very rare that we have to do any more exotic testing than that. Awesome. That is great. You know, like again, because a lot of functional medicine doctors now these days are moving towards just relying on advanced testing for each and every uh, protocols, you know, which can, you know, first of all, uh, ramp up the pricing and it is very difficult. Incredibly for expensive. Yes. Um, and sometimes I don't see even the clinical correlation, especially the food sensory testing, you know, like there is mm -hmm. not one perfect test, which I have always seen that it is very accurate. You know, they all, you know, uh, we have to just take it with a grain of salt. Correct. Correct. And in my clinic at the VA, the price for working with me was you have to commit to uh, doing our program at 100% gluten-free, dairy-free, more vegetables if you want to do the diet, or we could send you to the dietitian if you just want to work on the diet gradually, or I could send you to the psychologist if you want to just work on stress reduction, or I'd send you to the physical therapist if you just wanted to work on exercise. But if you want to come have our, our monthly group class with us, uh, then the ticket was you had to commit to 100 days of really doing the gluten-free, dairy-free, more vegetables diet. And uh, we, we never argued with our patients like, you're ready, great. If this isn't the right time, for whatever reason, go back to your primary care doc and then ask for another consult when it is the right time. That is awesome. You know, I think that's a great motivation and that's the right way of, you know, getting the right clients who need your help then and there. So, I think and, and they're ready to do the work. My job is to offer the possibilities, to give inspiration, to let them know that there are others who've been just as ill or more ill that have had uh, remarkable success. Uh, but I let them know that they're the ones doing the work. This isn't the right time to do that work. And we understand that uh, people can have a variety of challenges with their family responsibilities that this may not be the right time, but, and then come back when it is. 
Absolutely. I mean, those are like great words of wisdom. Um, we have like spoken about so many things. Any other like, you know, things about food specific that you want to share, especially for autoimmune patients like Hashimoto's or MS? You know, this is a family intervention. And we stress that uh, in my clinic, um, we stress that in our clinical trials, that it will be vastly more successful if you as a family agree, here are the foods we're going to add to our diet, here are the foods we're going to remove, uh, and to support the patient, we're, we're going to, as a family, not have these foods in her or his line of sight when he's eating, because it, it, it'll be much easier for him to comply. Um, but if when you're away from the, the patient, eat what you want. But when you're with them, you're going to be supportive and their line of sight will just have supportive foods. Absolutely. I mean, it, I think it's a great uh, tip that everybody should be knowing that it's a family effort and uh, everybody gets better with it. You know, like, you know, uh, you know, other family members who try the diet, mm -hmm. also, it's often times that, you know, they see so many health benefits in themselves also. Yes, yes. We, we, you know, we'd find people, uh, the migraines go away, the chronic headaches go away, the pelvic pain and endometriosis goes away, the infertility goes away, the erectile dysfunction goes away, the high blood pressure goes away, the irritable bowel problems go away, and the energy level comes back. So people thought that they were just sort of getting older, and now they realize, no, 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 they're, they are having more energy, more vitality, and their spouse is better now, but they are more energetic uh, and more successful in their life as well. Awesome, awesome. And I think you have a great clinical trial uh, that you were discussing uh, before that you are recruiting patients for that. So yes. please share some information about that. So uh, we have this wonderful trial, efficacy of diet on quality of life. Uh, we're recruiting people with relapsing, remitting, multiple sclerosis, uh, age 18 to 70. You'll have to come to Iowa at month zero, month three, month 24. Uh, and there are three diets. There's a ketogenic diet, a modified paleo diet, and usual diet. The usual diet arm will get information about how to improve your diet, reduce your vegetables. We'll give you a little cooking uh, videos and recipes. So we don't know which of the three groups will, will, will do the best. It's quite possible that my usual diet group, because we're, we're giving them uh, cooking tips every month, if they actually do decide to eat more vegetables, that they may do just as well as my two intervention arms. Uh, and we're very excited because we're, we're having MRIs at the beginning and at two years. We'll, this will be one of the largest and longest dietary studies that have been done in the setting of MS, uh, in the setting of autoimmunity to date. So we're thrilled, we're very excited. I'll be sure that you have the links so people uh, could screen. Uh, and you know, we'd love to enroll you. Absolutely. We will have all those links in our show notes. So please, uh, if you have MS, I will definitely recommend, you know, like enrolling. This is a golden opportunity uh, to, you know, get an intervention that can actually change your disease in your life. Absolutely. Great. Wonderful. Dr. Walls, it was a pleasure, pleasure talking to you. So many great things that you have shared with us over there. I know we can go for hours and hours, but, you know, uh, people uh, have so many great tips, but Tell us a little bit more about where people can find the work you're doing and how they can kind of follow you. Yeah, so come to uh, Terry Walls, that's T-E-R-R-Y, Walls, W-A-H-L-S dot com. Uh, and we have a one-page handout, a summary of the diet that we use in our study interventions. So that's terrywalls.com forward slash diet. Uh, and do sign up for my newsletter because uh, once a month, I'll do a roundup of the interesting uh, research in the autoimmune world. And I'm going to plug in that, you know, follow her on Instagram because I follow her on Instagram and every day or every few days, you know, she's just like showing us food, you know, like how she eats and, you know, like how to cook and, you know, like a, a great, great way of like, you know, looking at food. So I am always astonished. And if I am there on Instagram and definitely kind of follow you because uh, it's so great to look at food and how you're eating, which is so inspiring. You know, and I'll uh, give you glimpses of my garden. Uh, we'll give you tips uh, about resilience. Uh, you'll see me out in the meadows and the forest. 
Uh, and uh, more recently, I've started running again. So I'm now running through the neighborhood. So uh, that's uh, very, very exciting. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you again for coming over here and sharing your insight and knowledge with our audience. Thank you so much.